Uh, just so I can level set and my expectations of the audience here, uh, who here has done some text mining in R? You can show a hand, so a lot of you. Who here? We use tidy text. Okay, so that's really helpful, thank you. So in 2013, uh, in 2013 I had just finished my master's degree in math and statistics and was working for a science policy research institute. And uh, I had a group of our scientists come to me and say, uh, hey Tommy, we need uh, some stuff clustered. And I was like, great, I learned clustering in grad school, like, bring it on. Uh, and then they were like, here's your data set, and it was a bunch of documents. And I was like, uh, so I don't know if you guys know this, but I need numbers to cluster, and these are words. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> little did I know that my career was taking a sharp left turn at that moment. Um, so skip forward a few years, I'm a PhD student at Mason. Uh, my dissertation research is in topic modeling, so I guess I really just ran with that ball. But uh, somewhere between the two, um, <clears throat> I started, I wrote a package called TextMiner, which is what I'm here to talk to you about today. So uh, do you guys remember uh, Jim's talk yesterday about uh, Gmail? And he had that one slide that was uh, using the TM package to try and download his, G his uh, Gmail records. And then he had to create some weird V corpus object. And it didn't print well. And he wasn't quite sure what he was doing. And he got really frustrated and abandoned it and found another tool. Um, so back in 2013, that was not an option that was available to me. So TextMiner really started as a series of wrapper functions around the TM package and then also the LDA package that uh, I had written both to, well, obviously to make my job easier, but uh, really to enforce, I think, a more R way of doing things, which is uh, text mining is actually just statistical modeling, uh, just like the rest of what we do in R. <coughs> So um, I released uh, the first version, or the first public version of TextMiner with a little fanfare almost four years ago. Um, and so it's just sort of sat on crayon and been churning away. Uh, but in, in the intervening period, uh, something big sort of happened in that ecosystem, which is tidy text. So Julia Silji and her uh, co-authors have created this package that uh, is a unifying framework for uh, text mining in R. It is a much more R way of doing things. Um, so that really uh, compels the question today, right? If they've built this framework and it's got wide adoption and it's awesome because it is, uh, why might you still want to use text miner? Um, so one, I, I think uh, my way of thinking about things is still you know, a pretty good way. So it's, it's at least worth talking about. Um, but it's also sort of evolved into a, a pretty darn good topic modeling workbench. So my dissertation research uh, is in topic modeling and sort of as I, to this last point, as I uh, develop something and go through a proof of concept and I'm like, hey, this works pretty good, um, to, uh, TextMiner just becomes a landing pad for that. And so I'll, I'll throw it in um, and it's available to, to anyone who would care to use it. So um, this is what we're going to be talking about today. Oh, went one slide too far. This is what we're going to be talking about today. Um, for the sake of time, I'm just going to get in it. Um, so first, just a little bit of level setting and making sure we're sort of all on, on the same page, about, at least about how I think about these things. So one of two core mathematical structures you need to do text mining is something called a document term matrix. Uh, every row is a document, however you're going to define that, whether it's you know, a book, a research paper, a paragraph, a sentence. Uh, and every column is some sort of linguistic artifact, usually a word or a pair of words. We'll call them unigrams, bigrams, n-grams. Uh, and then inside your matrix is some sort of frequency measure. So if we're counting, that uh, would be the number of times uh, word J appeared in document I. The second core mathematical structure for text mining is something called a term co-occurrence matrix. So that's relating terms to terms. So it's a square matrix. It's not necessarily symmetric. Um, <clears throat> this could be a count. You could be displaying a count of the number of times word I and word J co-occurred in the same document together. Uh, it could be a count of the number of times word I and J appeared within a fixed window of each other, so like within five words of each other. That's called the skip gram model, if you guys ever hear about that. Uh, or it could be something like the number of times word J appeared 
within five words after word I or something like that. <clears throat> and so basically these two matrices are what we're doing math and statistics on uh, that basically lends itself to any manner of natural language processing applications. <clears throat> and so uh, a basic pipeline for, for doing these sorts of analyses is you've got your raw data that are your documents. You need to curate them and clean them up and turn them into a matrix of data that you're then going to feed to a model or algorithm. Uh, you're going to look at the results of that model and decide if you're, you're happy with where you are and you might uh, iterate between one and three several times until you get something that you think stands up. Uh, and then hopefully if you have a good model, um, I don't have to report the results here, but you know that's assumed. Uh, but hopefully if you have a good model, it, it generalizes to some sort of population. And so you would then apply that model to new data from, that is drawn from that population. And um, if this sounds familiar to everyone, uh, it should, because this is also just how we do statistical analyses. Uh, and so, again, it is just sort of like a soapbox thing for me, because like, really I, I am a statistician, not like an NLP guy. Um, th this is just statistics. It's, uh, what, what I have found is that many NLP packages, both in R and outside of R, they're, they're sort of these little like cut off enclaves of their own weird data types that have this, their own weird workflow and syntax. And it doesn't need to be that way because it, you're not actually doing anything that is, you know, meaningfully different than what you're doing for any other type of data that you would analyze. Uh, so my second, my second soapbox issue here. Uh, so many uh, models of text uh, so uh, I'm going I'm to pick on word to vec for a little bit. Um, they, they get wrapped up as uh, sort of this, this black box where they don't really differentiate how you're handling your data from the statistical or mathematical method that you're using. And uh, you know, I, that, that's really misleading because a lot of where the battles won or lost, uh, a lot of the different meaning and how you might interpret the results of the exact same mathematical model happens here. Right, so you're making these sort of very fundamental decisions when you're going to set up this data matrix, and um, that is where things are won or lost. So uh, in a few slides, I'm going to talk about, uh, well, I'll just say it now. Uh, so topic models and text embeddings are actually the same thing. Uh, just, you just give a term co-occurrence matrix to one and a document term matrix to the other. I don't think that's terribly obvious from the way we, we currently think or talk about these. But uh, So I wanted something that, that sort of decoupled data curation from modeling uh, so that was a little bit more obvious. Uh, so moving on to scalability concerns, right? So I, I do actually think that a reason that a lot of these NLP packages are hard to use isn't because the people who made them are dumb or they don't care about you. It's just that until very recently, uh, they were solving a scalability problem and the usability problem was second. We've now only, only just now reached a point where uh, we, we can just assume that things will scale and so now we can focus on utility. Uh, so a quick equation. Um, have you guys ever thought about how memory gets allocated in R when you, when you create an object? Like how big is something? Where, where does that come from? So with a matrix, you're gonna have the number of rows times the number of columns, because each entry in that matrix is just a number and that has to be given a, a memory address. If we're doing integers, then that memory address is gonna be eight bytes. And I think if it's float, I wanna say it's like 46, 43, something like that. But Let's just stick with integers. So I've got n rows times k columns times 8 bytes. That's how many bytes this thing should take up in memory. And I want to divide by a billion if I want to see that it's in gigabytes. Now for most uh, statistical analyses, you have to have like a lot of that for it to amount to something. So how big could these possibly get in uh, text mining? <laughs> So this is uh, uh, what happened when I tried to allocate five terabytes of memory on my MacBook Air. <laughs> um, so 100,000 documents uh, times six million uh, unique words, and that was after removing stop words, mind you, um, times eight bytes divided by a billion is just, just shy of, of five terabytes there. So uh, it's just another couple examples here. Um, so these are more, more moderately sized corpora. Um, you know, 10,000 observations, I mean, that's, that's not a lot in, in normal statistics land, but you can end up using half your, 
half your available memory on your machine right there if you're using a standard matrix. So a big important thing in a lot of uh, uh, text mining and natural language processing applications is we need some sort of sparse matrix to be able to get memory savings so we can actually work on these things without needing like a supercomputer or a big server. I'm going to come back to that in a bit. So briefly worth talking about the philosophy here. So when I created this package, I wanted to honor three basic principles. Um, I wanted to use data types to enforce maximum interoperability within R's ecosystem. I didn't want an enclave. I wanted something that could just integrate with the rest of R, even if it had nothing to do with NLP. Um, I wanted syntax that was idiomatic to R. So if you're coming to text mining and you're pretty good at R, I would like you to be able to sort of like have some intuition of what's going on. And then, of course, for reasons that we just discussed, things need to be scalable in terms of object storage and computation time. And so I'm going to give you an example of each one of those uh, that I've done in, in TextMiner. Uh, so the first here uh, deals with both interoperability and scalability. So we need a sparse matrix type. So the TM package uh, uses sparse matrices from the SLAM package. I think that stands for sparse lightweight arrays and matrices. Uh, and then TextMiner and Text2Vec, and I think maybe Quandetta, a few others, use sparse matrices from the matrix package. Um, and I think um, one of these things is not like the other. Um, so <laughs> matrix actually ships with the CRAN version of R. It's really well embedded in that ecosystem. Uh, in fact, we actually saw it yesterday during Jared's talk uh, when he was talking about sparse matrices. I saw there was a little DGC matrix uh, and so it works with, with Glimnet, right? Nothing to do with, with NLP, but you could just make a document term matrix, hand it off to Glimnet, maybe that'll do something for you. Uh, just so you guys don't think that I am confusing quantity with quality, uh, <laughs> here's the popularity of, of various text mining frameworks in R. Um, <laughs> Maybe you guys will like what you see, and uh, you can help me out with that. Uh, so uh, idiomatic syntax, what does that mean? I'm not even sure how to define it. Um, so instead of defining it, I'm just going to show you some code here. Um, so up there at the very top, that's interoperability again. Uh, your documents are just a character vector. You can store your documents with your metadata in a data frame or a list or something. I, I don't care. Um, R has lots of base classes that work perfectly well for this. I don't know what a v-corpus is. I don't know why I should have to know what a v-corpus is, and I don't know why you guys should have to know either. Character vectors work fine. Single function to create a document term matrix is a similar create TCM function that's there as well. And then you want to fit a topic model, you just hand your matrix off to it. So in three steps, we've gone from raw documents down to fitted topic model. Um, I've created an S3 class for all the topic models that uh, TextMiner supports. So when you get new data and you want to get a prediction under that model, uh, you can just use a predict method. And so I don't, ha I don't spell out the arguments there, but it's predict object comma new data, just like all of the rest of the models that we have in R. And then finally, uh, Speaking towards scalability, I wanted TextMiner to use all of your cores by default, although that's an option you can change. But because of the, the size and scale of, of language data, uh, you know, we really need parallelism. But my cell phone has multiple cores at this point, right? So this shouldn't be something that's relegated to somebody with a background in high performance computing. And so I wrote this, this wrapper function around um, stuff from the parallel package to handle. Uh, parallelization, whether you're using a Unix system or whether you're using uh, uh, Windows. And then Jared pointed out to me the other day that um, Do Parallel has actually done that since 2011. So maybe, maybe that's not quite so novel and maybe we shouldn't have statisticians writing uh, uh, parallel algorithms. So <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll look into that. But <laughs> meanwhile, that's, that's, that's what's running in the back end. Uh, so very quickly in the last uh, five or so minutes that I have, so my, my focus has been on, on topic modeling, and so that's, that's where a lot of the modeling components of TextMiner have come in. And so uh, as I said before, this is sort of my mental model for, for topic models and text embeddings. They're all basically matrix decomposition methods. 
So with latent semantic analysis, you're using a single value decomposition, you're factoring a matrix. With uh, latent Dirichlet allocation, you're using some probabilistic decomposition, right? But basically all of these, well, and then text embeddings, you're just doing that with a term co-occurrence matrix. All of these result in these smaller dimensional matrices. So rather than having to use uh, dozens of packages that uh, represent them all differently, instead I've written some wrappers that sort of enforce this. So I've got one matrix that is a distribution of topics over whatever the rows of my matrix were, and then another one that is a distribution of words over those topics. And so looking at the output of, um, this is the output of, a, of an LDA object in TextMiner, and just focusing in on those top two, I know it's kind of small, but we've got phi and theta. And so every topic model that I have either implemented or written a wrapper for, you get at least those. So you can actually compare directly, like do I want to use model A or model B and spend, instead of spending all of your time grappling with the syntax and things like that. Uh, that said, I, I am but one man, so uh, I've, I've only wrapped, uh, oh, I've implemented LDA over the summer. Uh, that was a wrapper uh, until very recently. And then wrapped uh, correlated topic models and then LSI. Um, I've got a few more that I've experimented with, but I hate to compare myself to Steve Jobs, but uh, <laughs> defaults really matter. You know, he talks about it, computers being the bicycle of the mind, right? So I have these other wrappers that are sitting around, and I just I don't want to release them until I know enough about the model to say that if you are just dumb enough to just be like, here's my data, give me something, that that something is going to be like a, a reasonably good choice. Um, but I would love help. Uh, so if anyone else wants to, to give, me a shout, uh, give me a shout out, um, I'd love to get more models in there. And then uh, these are just a list of a subset of uh, topic modeling helper functions that are that are available in text miner so like I said it's turning into a pretty darn good topic modeling workbench so this uh, second to last little section here as I said I'm, I'm getting a PhD I'm focusing on topic modeling and so as I've developed certain things and decided I'm happy with them uh, you know text miners become a landing platform for them so uh, anyone who wants to use them and finds them useful, uh, TextMiner is a great place. Anyone who wants to use them and tell me all the ways I got it wrong, uh, you can open up an issue on GitHub. Uh, so the first one is um, a couple years ago I derived a, uh, a, a real R squared for, for topic models. And it's not a pseudo R squared. It's not something that just looks like R squared. It is, in fact, the proportion of variability in your data that has been explained by your model. Um, I've got a whole other talk for this, but uh, just the punchline in, in like a couple sentences. You can look at the normal R squared that we use in linear regression as a ratio of sums of squared Euclidean distances in one space. So we can generalize that to n space, and this is a picture of total sum of squares and residual sum of squares in two space. You can generalize it to n space, and then you can get an R squared from a topic model, because it's basically saying under the model, how well does this compare to the document term matrix or term co-occurrence matrix that you, that you handed me? In 2013, uh, I developed a met metric called probabilistic coherence. Coherence is uh, a measure of topic quality, and um, I wasn't satisfied with anything else that I'd found there, so I used a little bit of probabil probability theory, developed this metric, I thought it was great. I actually wanted to write it up and do a small paper and realized I had zero baseline for objective comparison to say it was better than any, any other metric out there. Uh, and then I was like, oh God, and that's what my dissertation's on, but I'm not gonna get into that now. Um, I recently found out that somebody else had der derived the exact same metric in 2011 and published it, and uh, it really just didn't get circulated widely. It took me many years to even discover that it was out there. Uh, so that's, that's one less paper I have to write, so you know, great. <laughs> Um, <laughs> but uh, it, I, I like it, and I think it works really well. Um, I'm actually not going to get into this so much, but uh, needless to say, a lot of my research has indicated a, a need for some more flexibility in uh, an implementation of LDA, and so that's what I wanted to do. So 
Um, the LDA implementation that TextMiner has has a lot more flexibility for setting priors, although it still has pretty good defaults, I think, as well as a, a more traditionally Bayesian statistic sort of handling of, of this model. All right, so in the future, I want to do a bunch of things. Um, I think that update method is really important because anyone who's used a topic model and then said, this is great, now I want to add new data, uh, it realizes that when you retrain it, the thing that was topic five that you loved is not topic five anymore and you don't know where it went. That, that, that seems like a pretty big usability issue, so I want to tackle that. Um, TextMiner is on CRAN, and I have stickers. They look like that. They're in the back, and I have a ton more, so I'd be happy to give uh, lots of stickers to people. Um, and if you want to get started, uh, thanks to my friend BJ who's sitting back there, uh, I, he pressured me into writing a whole bunch of vignettes. And so uh, they're there available on the CRAN distribution. Thank you.